Pod, pod, podcast playlist. You are listening to Podcast Playlist, a podcast about podcasts, where I, Brendan Hutchins, share what I've been listening to and why you should listen to. I intend to keep this show safe for work, but as a warning, today's podcast contains explicit language. If that doesn't bother you, let's continue. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm fortunate to have a job where I can spend all day listening to whatever I please, and most of the time, I choose podcasts. Podcasts have been a source of news and comedy, and a way to learn about topics I've always been interested in and things I've never heard of. This is the first episode of Podcast Playlist in a series devoted to S-Town, an audio masterpiece that takes podcasting to a new level more akin to literature than you may expect. S-Town is by the producers of This American Life and Serial. I'll talk more about the producers in a future episode of this series, and another episode will be called Spoiler Town, where I discuss themes and details with David Callison from the Sound and the Story podcast. But for now, this episode will be a spoiler-free dive into the story and experience of listening to S-Town. S-Town is a seven-part series ranging from 48 to 63 minutes per episode, released all at once, for a total of six and a half hours. It's bingeable right now. The main premise is about John B. McLemore, a clockmaker in Alabama who contacts Brian Reed at This American Life about a murder that he believes was covered up by the police. However, the show is more about understanding the people of Woodstock, Alabama, what John calls shit town, their misunderstandings, their feuds, and their humanity. Should you listen to it? Yes. The crew behind the show is a group of seasoned producers and hosts. The audio quality and production is top of the line, and it's just a great story that you'll want to hear to the end and talk about with all your friends, and hopefully me. I'm at the pod playlist on Twitter. The podcast, This American Life, brought the established radio show to the medium of on-demand audio programming, which has always felt like the podcast equivalent to, of a magazine. Serial tweaked and played with that format to bring podcasts to a new level of popularity and awareness. According to an article in Wired, Serial was modeled after television, ending each episode with a cliffhanger. S-Town is the refinement to the medium, to the mature artistic level podcasting deserves. I compare S-Town to This American Life and Serial, not just because they're from the same creators, but because they are two of the most well-known podcasts and they produce high-quality programming. To keep with the theme of a literary novel, each episode of S-Town is a chapter. Through the series and in each chapter, S-Town illustrates the human condition. In the first chapter, Brian defines proleptic, a word that John uses to describe the town. Proleptic meaning the representation or assumption of, of a future act as if presently existing is a theme throughout the series, with person after person declaring or claiming something to be true when it hasn't happened, or at least not yet. Another prominent theme is horology, the study of time and making clocks. Here's a clip from the first chapter. I'm told fixing an old clock can be maddening. You're constantly wondering if you've just spent hours going down a path that will likely take you nowhere, and all you've got are these vague witness marks, which might not even mean what you think they mean. So at every moment along the way, you have to decide if you're wasting your time or not. Anyway, I only learned about all this because years ago, an antique clock restorer contacted me, John B. McLemore, and asked me to help him solve a murder. With this, Brian is building a great analogy that sets a couple of themes and ideas to hook the listener, but quickly the podcast is no longer following the original investigation. When you contacted me, you wanted to know what actually happened. So it's progress in that sense, right? It's progress. I am not saving it's... the world over here. Climate change is... definitely not saving no. the world. Climate, cha- no, climate change is not ending. I am not bringing jobs and, and sustainable employment to Alabama and lifting people out of poverty. But you asked me to try and figure out what happened here. On that front, I've made progress. I feel like you've done pretty goddamn good. Well, thank you. S-Town is about a dead man, but that only scratches the surface. S-Town isn't about a town. It isn't about a murder. It isn't about a mystery. It, it's about people. The people of S-Town. Specifically, one person from that town. An amazingly talented and troubled person. John B. McLemore. An antique orologist, conspiracy theorist, poet, semi homeless sexual, chemist, masochist, canine caretaker, horticulturalist, 
altruist, mentor, pessimistic idealist, and atheist, yet he won't let any of those things define him. When I think about the end of my own existence, I take the biggest possible picture. I don't just look at myself as a 49-year-old semi-homosexual atheist living in a shit town full of Baptists in Buttfucksville, Alabama. I look at myself as a citizen of the world. I try to look at the biggest picture possible. He is most often simply described by his friends as a genius, but he is also known by the townspeople for how he can talk for hours and is exhausting. So you guys know John? Our mutual acquaintance, John B. McLemore. Oh, yeah. He's a character. I ain't never met nobody else like him. Nobody. Nobody like him. Nobody else like that from They've been bugging the piss out of you? I'm not there yet, but it's it's exhausting to hang out with him for a long day. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> He's exhausting after yeah, all day. Yeah, fuck yeah. His brain needs to slow the fuck down is what you want to tell him. Slow down. For a minute. And he is not without his quirks. Hold on. I'm on piss in the sink. I hope that's politically incorrect. That's something that flips Tyler out. Yes, I just pissed in the kitchen sink because uh, I, I, I tell him I can't, if, if the I, phone had enough signal, I'd just go out there and piss near one of the gardeners, the azaleas, the camellias, or the crepe myrtles because, you know, they like acid. <laughs> but I didn't think the phone had enough signal, so instead of wasting three or four gallons to flush the commode, I just peed here in the kitchen sink and used about one cup full of water to flush the sink. And, and I got a little short dick, but I got a, uh, a pretty good aim, so I can usually aim right for the center of that damn thing without splashing everywhere. <laughs> oh, man. But in any event, uh, what was the question? I forgot. I forgot, too. This may seem like a random or gross thing to do, but he's actually conserving water and fighting for his environmental beliefs. Halfway through the second episode, John becomes a friend. It felt as if by sheer force of will, John was opening this portal between us and calling out through it, calling from his world, a world of proleptic decay and decrepitude. A person who you want to get to know deeply, but shield your kids from. A person who is relatable, yet is fascinatingly new and different. If someone says the name John B. McLemore 25 years in the future, you'll, you'll remember exactly who that is. Oh my God. John, I'm never going to forget you. Come on. <laughs> S-Town is about the literal and metaphorical maze that John has made, not just for Brian, but for everyone he has ever contacted, for the townspeople in S-Town, and for everyone listening now. And for the second time, I find myself embarking on an investigation at the behest of an Alabamian horologist. The flow of the show is steady, starting new threads, but wrapping up others along the way. And the season ends with a great resolution, I won't spoil it, that is both bittersweet and utterly fascinating. The other night when we had church, he asked me some of my damn thoughts about life and death and, you know, whether or not I think there's anything when you die and you know, I probably rattled on and prattled on about a bunch of damn bullshit that makes sense when you're drunk, but probably doesn't when you're sober. So, What was the gist of it? Oh, the gist would be impossible to say. I mean, I, I went all the way down to quarks. Quarks, the subatomic particle. I mean, I was discussing the fact, you know, that in, for example, P and D orbitals, an electron can be in two places at the same time, but not in the middle. And I use that as an analogy to how it is now theorized that a quasars, which can appear, you know, light years distances across universes, can be fed by matter entering a spiraling black hole. I didn't understand most of that either. Don't worry. There's a lot of commentary in this show about small towns. My hope that there'd be some record of this in the newspaper. But she has no illusions about that. Most of it's probably hidden. It's not even in there. What do you mean? This town has a way of forgetting information and hiding information. When I was young, I lived in a small town here in Oregon. And this show has wonderfully captured that small town feel. Before John and I ever spoke, he warned me in an email, quote, I must tell you, it will take a long time for me to just impress on you what a crud fuck town and county this is. <laughs> but there's a fascinating other side to John's hatred of the town and the people in it. He hates it because he loves it. It's two sides of the same gold-plated dime. S-Town is a great name for the show. Throughout, that S has different meanings. 
here's how I break down the chapters. One, shit town. Two, social. Three, self-destruction. Four, scavenger hunt. Five, strife. Six, sexuality. Seven, struggle. I will go into more detail about each of those chapters in the upcoming Spoiler Town episode. During chapters four and five, the people of John's shit town try to make their way through the maze of John's mind and the world he has created, putting them through tests of will and morality, and even making them question themselves and their actions. Here is Rita, John's cousin. Half a year into the fight, Rita says she feels minimized by it too. Like the fight has turned her into someone meaner and cruder than she is. I'm serious. I mean, as a Christian, I even have trouble with this because you know you're supposed to love everybody. (laughs) And I don't want him to think that this is the kind of person I am. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a... I'm not that type of person. And here is Tyler, John's apprentice and friend. Do you see me being a bad person? Do I? Yeah. No, man, I see you as a complicated, normal person. You know, yeah. I, I I disagree with some of your decisions. So but you also you've had a you've had a very him. different life experience than I've I've had. Yeah. Why do you feel like a bad person sometimes? No, I just it's it's just I just want to know what people think of me because, I mean, how I do anything for anybody. This may be exactly what John is hoping for, as Brian analyzes in this clip. For the longest time, I thought the only connection between all of John's random interests was that it was all shitty. But the connection is deeper than that. He's distressed by the lack of outrage compared to the amount of shittiness in the world. To him, that ratio is totally out of whack. That part, the inaction, that's more disturbing to John than the idea of the murder itself. You know, I really hate that these kids know all the things that they know, and they just accept them as normal. I know, that seems to really bother you, huh? It's it's accepted as something you can't do nothing about. The shitty misfortunes John fixates on, they're not a bunch of disparate things. They're all the same thing. His shit town is part of Bibb County, which is part of Alabama, which is part of the United States, which is part of Earth, which is experiencing climate change, which no one is doing anything about. It maddens John. The whole world is giving a collective shrug of its shoulders and saying, fuck it. John relays a story of how the people around him see the world and the other people in it. And it takes some time for Brian to fully grasp John's analogy, but he ultimately does and explains it well. He's got on a pink top and nothing else. No fucking panties, no goddamn socks, barefoot. And I remarked that to Roger. I don't remember what I said. I probably said, my God, look at her, or something like that. And Roger's sage advice was, usually when you see jokers that look like that, they've done something to get like that. <laughs> that's, that's the lesson? went just straight through you. What I admire about John is that in his own misanthropic way, he's crusading against one of the most powerful, insidious forces we face. Resignation. The numb acceptance that we can't change things. He's trying to shake people out of their stupor, trying to convince them that it is possible to make their world a better place. Yes, that lady over there, she's barefoot and she's pantsless, but we can lend her shoes. We can give her some pants. Instead of just putting our heads down and speeding past her and muttering that she must have done something to get like that, we can ask her if she's in trouble, and we can offer her help. Some people argue that this series exploits the people in and around the story, but everyone agreed to be recorded for their interviews. John, after pushing away his friends and family in his life, reached out to Brian as a new companion. John not only uses Brian to help solve a murder and expose the town of Woodstock to the light of day, but John also shares his 53-page manifesto while they're sitting together. John uses Brian as a biographer. But the best times of my life, John goes on, I realize were the times I spent in the forest and field. I've walked in solitude beside my own babbling creek and wondered at the undulations, meanderings, and tiny atolls that were occasionally swept into its midst. I've spent time in idle palaver with violets, lyre-leaf sage, heliopsis, and monkshood. 
and marveled at the mystery of Monotropa uniflora. I have audited the discourse of the hickories, oaks, and pines, even when no wind was present. I have peregrinated the woods in winter under the watchful guard of vigilant dogs and spent hours entranced by the exquisiteness and delicacy of tiny mosses and molds, entire forests within a few square inches. I have also ran thrashing and flailing from yellow jackets. In addition to the incredible story, I find myself moved by the instrumental music used throughout as transitions and interludes. My head bobs as the plucked cello leads into the heavy beat. The music transports and engulfs me into the story. I'll be talking with David on the Spoiler Town episode a little bit more about the music. Even though clips of interviews are played out of order for narrative effect, I can tell when Brian is interviewing based on his skill level, his comfort and his questions, because during the three years that he devoted to this man in this town, he grows as an investigator and a reporter. I'm very excited to see more from Brian Reed and the rest of the crew. S-Town is neither serial nor a true grand podcast. It's a journey through the degrading mind of a troubled genius. This podcast shines from its use of storytelling and analogies to convey morals and humanity. This isn't light listening, but something that reflects a mirror on yourself and your community. S-Town is a well-produced, enthralling, and thoroughly entertaining podcast. Like a great book, you don't want to put it down. In fact, I listened through six times. S-Town gets better with each repeat experience. I'm so glad that John reached out to Brian and they went on this journey together. You can find more at stownpodcast.org and the links will be in the show notes. This is my first in a series from podcast playlist just about S-Town. My next episode will be Spoiler Town, taking clips from my conversation with David Callison of the Sound and the Story podcast, and patrons at patreon.com slash podcast playlist will be able to hear the full hour and a half conversation where we are spoiling the entire series of S-Town, as well as diving into the music of the show. Please check it out. If you would like to support the show to keep the recommendations coming, please visit patreon.com slash podcast playlist. You can sign up for a small reoccurring patronage and get rewards like the aforementioned extra episodes and other bonuses. This episode was recorded in Keeping It Weird, Portland, Oregon. Writing, music, and narration by Brendan Hutchins. The producer and script editor was my amazing wife, Sarah Hutchins. The chief advisor was Yuvi Zalko from the podcast Neurotic Tornado. And moral support and infinite distractions were provided by Sebastian and Autumn, Sarah and my cats. Send me your comments, suggestions, and recommendation success stories. I'm at the pod playlist on Twitter. I'll accept text or audio messages to the podcast playlist at gmail.com. You can leave a comment on the post at podcastplayl.ist, where you can also see the show notes. Please subscribe to this feed, rate the show on iTunes, follow at the pod playlist on Twitter, and I will talk to you next time. Happy listening. Peace. Pod, pod, podcast playlist. <laughs>